Hey everyone, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski. Thank you so much for joining us on episode number 94 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today's guest is Dr. Laura Eisenberg, winner of the 2021 World Series of Poker Ladies Tournament. She is an MD with a radiology practice in Maryland. She's also a skydiver, and she's currently writing a chapter for Lena Evans's upcoming book, Poker for Life, on the impact of poker on the brain. On today's show, we'll get to know Dr. Lara a little better. Uh, Doc, I got to call you Doc. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to the Cards Chat Podcast. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks for having me. It's really cool to meet you. And may I also say, I know we were chatting a little bit before we hit the record button, but I wanted this specifically to be on the record. Um, yours is one of the maybe two or three that ahead of the podcast, I was like giddy. I was telling my kids, I was like, guess who I get to interview today? She's like super cool. And I was telling her like your story and stuff. So I'm really eager uh, to learn more about you more, you know, than I just sort of seen on uh, on TV, on screens and stuff like that. So um, yeah, thanks for being cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. Um, so I understand you started playing poker around 20 years ago. And I'm wondering, are you one of sort of like the many, many, many legions of, of poker folks that began playing in the wake of Chris Moneymaker's win? Or was there sort of a different inspiration for you? No, I mean, like I always had a, a sweet spot in my heart for Vegas. We used to go every year when I was a kid. And I remember like nobody kind of cared what you were doing back then. And my parents would give me like one silver dollar each time we'd walk through the casino to go to breakfast. And I could put it in, pull the handle one time. And like the first time I won, I was like, Vegas is the best. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I was like, there's just like free money to be had. And then we'd play like Kino at breakfast. And I was like, yeah. so the gambling bug got planted early. But um, I was a, I was actually a PC gamer and okay. um, so had like a souped up PC and blah, 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 all that stuff in the uh, early days of gaming. And I was actually, I mean, I was, I guess, 30, early 30s when the moneymaker thing happened mm -hmm. and watching a commercial after watching the news after dinner one night and a commercial came on for probably poker stars or something. And I was like, people are playing poker on the internet for money. Like yeah. this is a thing you can actually do. I'm like, that's crazy. I was like, why am I playing games in my basement for nothing? You know, that's mm -hmm. dumb. So literally didn't know anything about poker. Oh, wow. um, didn't okay. know what beat what. I mean, didn't know anything at all. But I was wow. like, sure, there's books. Like, how hard can it be? So, you know, pick up whatever books there are. So there's Harrington and there's, you know, the Malmuth books. And like, that was not, you know, that was like the majority of it. And there was the, of course, the super system. Mm -hmm. you know? and then you were done with books almost like right. that was all that was ever around so like you read that stuff and then everybody was playing limit so I started playing limit and then going to Atlantic City now and then and then one day there's no limit tables so I say sure I'll sit at a no limit it's probably not that different and uh, <laughs> oh whoa, it's really different you know yes. and, uh, and then somewhere along the way there was a charity tournament and played that and I was like whoa I love tournaments you know mm -hmm. it's like a whole story that you know from start to finish and so started playing more charity tournaments and then Maryland got casinos. Right. Um, and was able to start doing that as well as playing online and uh, started venturing out to Vegas a little bit and World Series, you know, World Series you know, stuff and uh, kind of went from there. But so it was around the moneymaker time. Right. There's a lot to unpack there. I feel like I have already 10 different questions that I didn't <laughs> plan. No, it's great. It's such a very cool story. So I, I like, I can, you know, want to sort of isolate little parts of that, but I'm kind of wondering, Okay, so you enjoyed the casino life already as a youngster. That's a cool thing, like the dollar in the slot machine. You know, that that whole excitement, that's something that, you know, mm -hmm. gives us all a big, a big turn on. What is it about poker in particular that, you know, again, so you saw Moneymaker, you know, that's great, but there's still all those other sort of games in the casino. What is it about poker in particular that attracted you and also that you're chasing? when you sit down at the tables, whether live or online? Yeah, I think, I mean, to me, it was, you know, cause I played blackjack some before poker, you know, and, you know, and I, I, I used to play pool in college and the guys I would hang out with were all, you know, kind of degenerate gamblers. And they were, you know, all about poker, or I mean, all about blackjack and you can count cards. So I, you know, I learned some basic stuff about card counting, never did it in a casino, but um, I liked that idea that you could have an edge in mm -hmm. the casino. But it was, I guess, a small edge, and then, you know, you get in trouble if you're counting cards, et cetera. So I didn't really get into it. And when I started learning about poker, I understood 
you know, immediately that this was a game that you could have an edge, just a skill edge mm -hmm. and permanently, you know, that would keep increasing over time as you learned. And so it just felt immediately so different to me than any other thing that you would do in a casino where you're basically always losing and you're just having fun um, as opposed to something where you can be a long-term winner. And so that was super appealing, you know, to me. And it, I mean, I always figured it wasn't going to replace my income as a physician, you know, but I'm a very competitive person, you know, and I like to compete in, you know, I'm not super athletic. So that was never really an avenue for me for, you know, is to play a lot of competitive sports. So when I started playing pool in college, like that, you know, really got the competitive bug going. Um, and then it was skydiving and then poker. Um, and so just always having a competitive outlet to, you know, learn and challenge yourself, you know, was uh, very appealing. For sure. And that's, you know, that's obviously not a trait unique to, uh, you know, to, to focusing it on poker. Clearly, you know, you, you went and studied medicine. You certainly challenged yourself. You know, only the best of the best get into medical school in the first place, uh, you know, let, let alone graduate from medical school. A lot of people, though, who I've interviewed and, you know, whose stories, you know, we know in the poker world who became professionals, like they said similar things, you know, it triggered their competitiveness, they saw the potential to win money, and then they made that sort of decision to, okay, this is a cool game of like, hey, I can make a living from this, I could go pro, you know, by the, on the face of things, someone with, you know, your aptitude for the game, the intensity, ability to study, that sort of a thing, could have taken that path. And perhaps, you know, at some point, you know, when in medical retirement, you may take that path. But what is it that, um, you know, for lack of a better phrase, kept you grounded in more of a conventional, this is, you know, a good proper job and I'll keep poker as a, as a side pursuit? Yeah, I mean, to me, I always wanted to go into medicine in the first place because it was like baked into the job is that you're helping people, mm -hmm. you know, sure. and I think, that a lot of people want to be able to feel that they're giving back and they're contributing and they're doing something to help people. And there's so many different ways that people can do that philanthropically through charity, et cetera. Um, but it's nice to have it kind of baked into the job to begin with. And I, when I discovered I liked poker, I mean, I was just in my first job because as you know, it's like your whole twenties are studying yep. uh, and going through school and training. And so you're 30 ish by the time you're out. Um, you know, and that's right around the time that I discovered poker and I was, you know, working in a regular job then, but it just getting going, you know, and just, you know, getting started and all that. So I never thought of it then as something that I would do professionally, uh -huh. uh, you know, and I think it would be pretty hard for me to play professionally and, you know, match a physician income every uh -huh. year, you know, right. I mean, maybe at the top, very top echelon you know, of people, but I don't, I'm not arrogant enough to think that, you know, I would necessarily be at the top, even if I did anything full, you know, if I played full time and studied full time. Sure. And I like sure. having it, um, you know, where it is, you know, I definitely like, I have plans to cut back on the amount of work that I'm doing in the fairly near future. Um, and, you know, have like where I'm working one week on and two weeks off, nice. um, which will allow me to play more um, and do other things too. You know, I like to travel. I want to see family more and all of that stuff. So I'm kind of stepping my way towards retirement. Sure. And obviously, you know, radiology is something that enables that slightly more easily than being, for example, uh, you know, in the emergency room every single day. So um, yeah. actually yeah. ER work is lends itself to that really well too. Really? Know? Oh, that's okay. I, I didn't realize that. But you're doing shifts, right? And so okay. it's not like, you get you break your toe, for example, and you know that you've got to have so and so as your emergency room doc. You just go to the emergency room. Whoever's there mm -hmm. is your doc, mm -hmm. right? So you just sign up for less shifts if your oh, group allows that, you know. But or do locums work like that's the kind of thing. Whereas mm -hmm. if you have a family practice, you know, or an internist, and you have a group of patients, like that's your people, and you need to be available to them, and you can't just decide you're not going to work. Much. Right. right. Yeah. See, my dad's a you know, has a family practice, sports medicine. So that that's the model of doctor I'm more intimately familiar with. It's interesting. I can't help but notice you mentioned something about breaking a toe. Very interesting example there um, <laughs> that you chose to bring that you chose to bring up. Um, yep. Yeah, so you mentioned, uh, you know, I, I look, you know, it's stats, you know, we look, you know, we're numbers people in, in the poker game as well. You have 16 WSOP caches, you have a, a WSOP ring, you've obviously got the, the bracelet from the ladies event, numerous other final table appearances at non WSOP events. So, 
you know, in your spare time, the time that you've taken, you know, to not work uh, professionally, but in your side pursuits, you've developed one heck of a, of a pretty cool Hendon model with a lot of results. You know, we're not supposed to be results oriented, of course, but, you know, the results are there, uh, which is pretty awesome. And you mentioned, you know, you kind of got bit by that tournament bug. It's specifically that competitiveness in tournaments. Tournaments, obviously, though, they have a much higher variance element to them than, let's say, cash games, where you'd say a professional player who plays cash games, you know, they can win 75, 80% of their sessions, and that's much more stable, uh, so to speak, you know, when you, when you do things properly. When you're sort of searching for stability, why don't cash games have that same appeal to you? Um, I'm not searching for stability. At all, as a poker player, I'm saying. No, I'm not. You know, and I think that's where I think actually being a recreational poker player or mm -hmm. semi pro, whatever it is, not relying on poker for your income is a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if I go to a tournament series and brick everything, that's not a huge setback to me on my year necessarily. Right. Okay. You know, and so I don't feel this. I don't think I would. I think I would feel much more stress around poker and outcomes if that was how I was paying my bills. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think it's important for recreational players to realize that like you have, you do have an advantage there. It's usually people mentally flip it the other way. And as you know, and, and pros will talk about, you know, like this is this guy's one tournament. He came, he came all year to play this one tournament. Sometimes that's true. Um, but I think it's really important as a recreational player to not be in that mindset and, hmm. you know, to realize that instead you actually probably have somewhat of an edge there. If you think of it in the right way, assuming right. you're properly bankrolled. Right. You know? Right. Well, obviously, you know, that that properly bankrolled something we always have to know, never play above your means. That's important. Uh, and I like that perspective. It's very refreshing. And, you know, most of the players we interview here on the Card Chat podcast, they do this for a living as professionals. So I'm curious to hear your take. Obviously, you know, you do treat poker seriously as a, you know, something competitive. You do study. Um, as a recreational player with all of your other uh, commitments, uh, professional, personal, all that stuff, how much of the free time that you dedicate to poker, if you could take a percentage of that time, is play versus study? For me, it's hugely skewed towards study, mm. honestly, you know, because, you know, I'm, in, I'm part of BBZ, um, you know, as a member. Um, and that right there, if you keep up with the seminars, is probably 12 hours of content a week. Just wow, that's a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And then anything else that you do on your own of, you know, reviewing, you know, your online play, um, or looking at, you know, other videos and things like that, reading, you know, some books or whatever, you know, that's on top, you know, of any of that. And that's not the only site that I belong to, mm -hmm. you know, so I probably, I mean, probably doing a minimum of 10 hours of study a week or maybe 15, um, you know, and so, you know, and I, I try on my weeks off to play a couple of days a week online. But I also travel and do other things on my time and I don't, you know, not do that stuff specifically to stay home and play online poker right you know and so i'm pla i'm playing just a ton less volume than you know most people probably mo mo less than a lot of recreational players honestly uh -huh. um, because my work right now is i work seven days on seven days off and so that's half the weekends you know and on the other half of the weekends i like to spend time with my wife and do other things too sure so that you know that means i'm typically shooting more towards playing series and stuff like that got you know? it and so I'm excited to play when I do, uh, you know, play, but I think that, you know, it's very important to play and it's important to get the reps in, you know, and that's where playing online can help you do that very efficiently because you can just get in so much more volume in a small amount of time and playing live doesn't do that, you know, but sure. I have a soft spot in my heart for live play. I think it's so much more fun. Yeah, we're, we're a peas of a pod in that, in that respect, that's for sure. Um, I think it's kind of like, you know, uh, imbues a little bit more life uh, into your days to play live poker than just yeah, smash well, a mouse on the computer screen. Um, yeah, it's a different game, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's all the psychological elements to it for not only yourself, but, you know, uh, playing with other people and understanding where their mindset is at too mm -hmm. is a big element of the game. Sure. You, know? so, um, you mentioned uh, BBZ and I'm, I'm familiar with quite a few poker training programs and that, you know, I am familiar with a little bit, but, uh, you know, through 94 episodes of this podcast, that one has never been mentioned to the best of my recollection. Why did you choose them? Who's involved in that? You know, maybe uh, 
you know, what appeal, and he said you're a member of other sites as well, but uh, since you mentioned them specifically, uh, you know, let's uh, tell uh, the audience a little about that and, you know, why is it appealing to someone with your, um, you know, the amount of time recreationally you do devote to poker? Sure. Um, and I, I don't think that BBZ is for everyone, you mm -hmm. know, it's a, it's somewhat of a higher level study right. mm -hmm. group. Um, and so I, I started out, um, and I've been, I had gone to other sites and done other things all through the years leading up to um, when I started training with Ape Styles. Yeah. Um, and so he was part of um, the group called Elevate, which was hmm. part of, um, uh, I'm blanking on what it was, uh, a, another group that was underneath there that Rob Tinian had, had uh, started. And so that ended up being a very small group of us in Elevate. I mean, like 10 maybe wow. or okay. 50 that were studying with Ape Styles. And it was a huge, huge thing for me. Um, you know, I learned so much and so much more in depth poker study um, in the couple of years that that was around, which was started in 2007, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then, oh, sorry, seven, 2017. Okay, and great. then in 2020, is when um, that was gonna it was kind of coming to an end, okay. and so Ape Styles, uh, Jordan, who started BBZ, uh, Big Bluff Sync, uh, he was trying to get Ape Styles to come over to BBZ. When he did, he moved over, and we all got like three months free within BBZ to see if we liked it. Oh, nice, um, cool. And, it, and so Ape Styles is now there, as well as the other coaches that are there, and it's a fantastic site. I can't always be on live for the webinars because they happen in what times that I'm working, mm -hmm. uh, but they're all recorded and you can catch up and, and, and watch them all. But um, just hearing like Jordan talk about his thought process around strategy alone is, is amazing. And Ape Styles has always been amazing. And then there's other coaches that are great. You get a lot of ICM uh, work in and work with like multi-way uh, situations and stuff like that. So it's, um, you know, if you just commit yourself to keeping up with the seminars and studying the stuff that's coming up every week, yeah, you will just learn a ton right then and there. It's funny. I mentioned I'm, I'm more intimately familiar you know, with my dad as a doctor in family practice and stuff, you know, as long as I remember, even when I was a kid, there were always these medical conventions he had to go to, you know, continuing <laughs> educations in another course. I mean, I studied English linguistics. That's it. I got my degrees and I was done. You know, that's, I, know I know what I know. And I, I think it's just very cool, like, you know, licensed professions, lawyers, but doctors specifically, like there's always these new developments. And sure, you may have your MD and you may be in practice and doing what you do, but it's almost like, you know, um, you know, uh, inherently inside you of like, oh, I'm never done learning. There's always more to learn. And obviously that's something that you know, applies uh, in the poker realm as well. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think like Josh Waitzkin's book, um, The Art of Learning, you know, really speaks to it a lot, you know, is that, and I think it's especially true in poker. And when you're talking about variance in tournament poker, you know, is that you have to have a very different mindset, you know, where it's, it's great to have results, you know, mm -hmm. and if the stars align for you such that, you know, you're able to final table or win an event, it's fantastic. But you have to really fall in love with the process of learning, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and and really enjoy that because that's the piece that you can control, you know. And you can't control any of the rest of stuff. I mean, if you keep getting better over time, you should have more wins. But there's no guarantees that you're going to have any of it, you know. And I think that one of the things that contributed to me, um, and for the ladies' event win, is I really had no expectations of anything for the whole tournament. I really didn't, you know. Oh. I just more so than I think most other tournaments that I've been in, it was just sort of like, whatever happens, happens. Kind of <laughs> like I really wasn't thinking about it to the point that I almost like, for, like I didn't know that it was going to be streamed. I didn't like, I wasn't paying attention to like any extraneous stuff at all. Wow. You know, that's such and a gift. It was, well, it was just, I didn't, I didn't set out to do it, you know, right. I just and for whatever reason, that particular tournament, but I think that that, if you can try to remember to have that attitude, that's super helpful. Cause like all I wanted to do was final table, a major tournament. That was like my next like to-do list, you know, you know, bucket item thing. Right. It wasn't to win anything. Cause I don't, it's just so much has to align for that. You know, Sure. when I made the final table, I felt like I'm done. Like this was like <laughs> a big goal. I hit it, you know? And uh, you know, you're coming in and like last place, like you don't, you can't go in expecting, okay, now I just win the thing and that's that. Right. You know, they just go, 
you know, if anything happens that's above last place from here, like that's huge. That's a great win. You right. Know? <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, I just didn't kind of didn't want to look like a fool on TV and didn't, you know, I wanted to, you know, play well. So right. I, I try to set my expectations before each tournament of just, you know, my goal is to have fun uh, and to, you know, really try to focus and play well. You know, that's such, such a healthy attitude to have. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, like we said, we're not results oriented, we're process oriented. You know, you got that down and you know, clearly all those years of study, the continuing, uh, you know, open mindedness to learn new things, tremendous assets. I, I feel sort of obligated to ask this, though. Um, and if the answer is no, so be it. Is there anything <laughs> specifically about radiology and what you do in your sort of day to day that helped you uh, or it helps you uh, with your poker play? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I think, first of all, developing the discipline to study just for medical school in general, like is going to benefit somebody in that, you know, you have to be able to, to get through medical school, you have to be able to study and learn the things you don't like, you know, I don't like it all. And anybody can learn the stuff they love, you know, that stuff's really easy, you know, and, you know, the ability to, and to have the willingness to sit down and kind of grind through the stuff that's not fun is mm -hmm. is important. And it's there's plenty of it in, in poker. I mean, like most people aren't just like, yes, another day of ICM Sims, hooray, <laughs> you know. But you know, it's important stuff. Um, and so I think that helps. Radiology helps a lot in that, like our work is, you know, I worked this morning for six hours. You know, it's sitting down and then focusing, and then it's and one case after the next, you know, I'll read 100, 120 cases in a typical shift, you know, and so you're just having to focus really intently for long periods of time, you know, with very detailed oriented work. Hmm. Um, and I think, you know, success in tournament poker especially requires that you have the endurance in your hmm. focus for a long day, you know, because <clears throat> I think there's a lot of EV at the towards the end of tournament days. When people are getting tired and fatigued, they've come back from dinner. Um, and if you're the one who's still able to be really sharp and focused, like you just right. started your day, that's enormous, you know, and it's hard to do that. Um, you know, especially if you're really applying yourself uh, earlier in the day, you know, it's, it's easy to just start getting tired and kind of melting down and kind of just like wanting to coast to the finish on the day. For sure. So. Uh, did you, I mean, I, you always hear these stories, you know, as a medical resident, did you have to do like those 24 and 36 hour shifts, that sort of thing as well? Yeah, I actually started in, out in surgery. Um, mm -hmm. So I did a year of surgery, um, planning to do all five years and then realized it wasn't for me. But mm -hmm. during that time, we had a lot of rotations where you were every other night call. And so in order to not to have any free time off at all, you'd double them up. So mm -hmm. you'd go like Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. So you'd actually go into the hospital at five in the morning on Saturday and you wouldn't go home till Monday night. You just be in the hospital the whole time. I mean, you would try to get sleep here and there. You learn right. how to sleep sitting up and you learn how to sleep sure. in any other time. Like you're just like stationary for a minute. Right. But, uh, you know, it's it's not good for your health. No, no. It's, but it is a useful skill to have at the poker table. That's for sure. It helps to be able to, you know, kind of stick. stick it out. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> for a lengthy period of time. Wow, goodness. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's uh, move in. Let's change gears as one that uh, likes to do in poker as well. Uh, poker in the Brain. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, the title of a book that uh, Lena Evans, Poker League of Nations, is putting together, compiling. Yep. What is sort of your involvement? How did it come about? And it also, I'm, I'm, you know, full disclosure, I don't really know too much about radiology. It would seem to be more perhaps the neurologist's uh, purview. So what is your connection to understanding uh, the brain? And, you know, again, a three-part sure, sure. question, I guess. Yeah, Lena. So Lena has a, you know, a particular interest in Alzheimer's um, and dementia mm -hmm. um, pursuits. And so, um, you know, I think there's definitely some evidence out there that, you um, different things that you do keeping your brain active can help sure. um, either delay onset or slow progression of dementias, um, you know, and so she wanted to write a book and have poker poker players specifically contributing mm. um, to, you know, talking about the ways that poker kind of has benefited them in their life um, and also trying to tie that in, you know, with the um, how they think it helps them mentally. Sure. Um, and a lot of the book was actually fleshed out before I was asked to write a chapter. So I'm still kind of figuring out where my chapter is going to fit in. Okay. But, uh, but maybe I think my chapter is going to be more around kind of the anti-fragility aspects hmm. and being, you know, how do you, you know, 
how poker helps you to, you know, overcome adversity in other areas of your life, you know, because I think poker to me has been so beneficial, like other things that I've done, like trying to get better at playing pool and skydiving competitions and stuff like that, all that stuff has similar sorts of things, but poker is, is really unique in that, you know, the variance aspect of it, um, makes it very mentally challenging, especially in tournament poker, as you were alluding to, mm -hmm. and that helps you, um, you know, to be able to kind of deal with adversity in your life in other ways, you know, and so, and I think just being able to approach things from an EV perspective and, you know, in your, the rest of your life too, and understanding like how that stuff works, I think is really helpful. So there's a lot of different, I mean, I think anybody can think about all the different ways that poker um, skills translate over into the rest of their life. And so that's, um, you know, kind of where, I, but I'm speaking to, and there's, I mean, there's so many things that, and training and getting good at any pursuit, trying to optimize your sleep, your diet, you know, your physical fitness, all of those things help with longevity and also help stave off dementias, you know, so it's more than just keep your mind active and, you know, there'll be less of a risk of dementia. It's all of these other lifestyle factors that used to not be associated with poker. And now they are, um, that I think are helpful. For sure. I mean, so many of us um, in poker media, you know, for, for a while, uh, what we try to do, we're always trying to, to grow the game. And we always say, well, one of the, uh, you know, the go-tos of how do we grow the game is, you know, sort of overlap poker with, I don't know, an influencer in YouTube or a celebrity or something and try to like pull in the audience for there and bring more poker players in. Um, you obviously have a, a very, again, you're in the poker world, clearly, but you're very much in the medical world as a professional, and you could speak to and about the game on a very high professional level, um, again, lack of a better word, despite only being a recreational player. You know, I, I have a similar thing, uh, in a way, you know, people see this skull cap on, they say, what's a, you know, a nice Jewish boy, Orthodox, you know, that sort of a thing, do playing poker, and then I can go ahead and tell them all about it. You know, so folks in the medical profession and, you know, nurses, doctors, orderlies, you know, they go ahead and hear about your success in the poker world. Does it ever come up that they ask you about it? How do you speak about it? Do you try to, you know, recruit more people or just speak of the game or, or is it just sort of two separate worlds for you? No, I think people think it's cool. I think sometimes people either think of themselves as a gambler or not a gambler kind of thing, yeah. you know, and so... Um, but I think that one of the areas like where, and that's why I think it's good for shows like Poker Go to always have some coverage of events that aren't just $100,000 high rollers because yeah. ordinary people don't see themselves there, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's like, you know, watching top flight boxing or something like that. It's fun. It's entertaining. It's never going to be you, right? you know, but when you see regular people that are winning, doing things that I think is appealing to people because they, they see where they can fit into that world, you know? And so, you know, I, I definitely have had friends and people like that, um, that, you know, wanted to talk poker or, and much more so since, you know, the bracelet, um, that people have wanted to chat about, you know, either poker hands or just like, what's it like to be, you know, playing poker and, and that kind of thing who aren't players. Right. Um, but I'm not like out actively trying to recruit the medical community or anything. Uh, That's like, I was a little more like that when I was in skydiving because you got when I first started you got a discount for each person you brought in for a tandem. <laughs> so I was like I was in surgery at the time, so I was like hitting up the burn unit. I'm like, come on, all the nurses, we gotta go, we right. gotta you know, get a group, you know. And I'm like, great, I got like four free skydives. I had no money, uh, <laughs> and not so much in poker. Right. Okay. So there's no sort of like home game that goes on in the, in the rec room or anything like that in between shifts uh, at the hospital. Or no. Well, I work from home. And so, oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. So that's part of it. So I work for a group that's based in California. So I work from five to 11 AM, which is for them 2 AM to 8 AM. Right. So I'm working with people that are up and down the East coast in different places, um, covering the half second half of the night shift for them. So, um, so I chat with folks, but it's a, that's why I like live poker too. Cause it's like a chance to get out and be with live humans. Cause otherwise my work is all at home. Now I used to work in the hospital for 17 years uh -huh. uh, first, and now I'm working from home. Cool. Well, that's good. I guess, uh, you know, I can't, can't help but reference, you know, I guess during the pandemic, I guess, you know, business as usual, so to speak. 
Well, I was already working from home before the right. pandemic. Right. Uh, but it wasn't business at all for usual per usual at all because mm. nobody was going to the hospital. Mm. So we had nothing to read. We were like knifing each other in the eyeball for chest x-rays to read. And uh, <laughs> so that was kind of crazy. Um, but, and so all we were reading was, you know, chest x-rays and CAT scans of the chest of people with COVID and right. everybody else. It was actually kind of awful because people were so so much avoiding the hospital that they weren't coming in until they had right. a ruptured appendix or a mm. heart attack or really bad stuff. Goodness. So it's, it's good to be past that phase of it for sure. Thankfully. Well, I, you know, I guess that you have more time to study during that period of time plus for, for poker. Yep. Yeah, there was that. But uh, you kind of can't like you still have to kind of wait for that chest x-ray to drop anyway. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you're on shift, you are on shift. I understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, um, you know, we'll get back a little bit more to sort of like that, um, the mental preparedness, you know, and we, we've touched on that quite a bit. Um, not just the, you know, the numbers, the math, that sort of poker study, but getting yourself mentally ready beyond your, I guess, natural experience and, and talent for doing so, uh, you've engaged with some mindset coaching, particularly primed mind, uh, and, uh, primed mind. Uh, that's with Elliot Rowe with Fedor Holtz. Uh, you know, that was episodes 20 and episodes 40 uh, here on the Cards Chat mm -hmm. podcast. If folks want to listen to that, uh, tell us how did you sort of get uh, involved in that in the first place? And why did you feel a need specifically to dive deeper into that when you kind of already had experience doing, uh, you know, being fully, you know, mentally prepped uh, as, as you've detailed already? Well, I don't think that I was any kind of a mental prep genius at any point in time or now even, but, um, you know, I think I started learning that like mental game training was a thing when I was in skydiving and competing, mm. you know, somebody had written like the mental game of skydiving and I was like, intrigued like what is this you know and like learning about how meditation can help you and all of these other sorts of things and we did a lot of visualization um in skydiving um and so i, I came across elliot rose stuff because i think he was doing like a special for his mp mp3s when that was his, primarily that was the focus of his stuff and i was like wow that's kind of neat you could have these mp3s that like you that you use to warm up before you play that's neat mm -hmm. and uh, then he, you know his whole thing kept growing uh, yeah. to where, you know, he had like a course on putting in volume, like a simple volume system. And then, um, and then that grew into a whole, uh, you know, bigger, um, mental game group that we had, yeah. which eventually morphed into what it is now, which is his, you know, tournament, uh, a game masterclass, which I think is, is fantastic. Yeah. And between that and Jared Tendler's books, you know, which were great as well on the mental game. And now he has a WSOP class as well. Yeah. Like those things, I think really took things to another level, um, you know, in, in the Elliot Rose group that preceded the A-game masterclass, we did a lot of things with experts talking about sleep and diet and all of the, you know, you know, and he really expanded to go, you know, it's not just, you know, play an MP3 before and after you play and like, you're good to go. You know, it became, you know, much more about kind of understanding like how learning happens and how we all tend to focus so much on, you know, learning new things and just learning, learning, learning new things, but you really need to pave that information as well. And, you know, the repetition and things that help move it to unconscious competence, you know, and oh. so that really helped me change how I trained and learned for poker so that I'm not just trying to learn new things, but I do lots of drills every day um, to try to, you know, to really reinforce knowledge and make it much more available, you know, because if you're playing online, you have se seven seconds to make decisions before right. you're in time. You know, and live, you can't just sit there forever either, you know. and Some people do. Uh, you watch public go lately. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, well, at least at the WPT, you got the little clock things. There you, you go, the action uh, clock, of course. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Sure. But, um, you know, so that, you know, and I just think that that stuff is fascinating. You know, to me, like thinking about and learning about how you can optimize, you know, through sleep, diet, and all of these other factors, you know, that, um, you know, and also to me, I think that those factors are really important for somebody who's not a professional to focus on because these are areas where you can make up ground against a professional hmm. um, isn't doing those things and it's cheap and you can do it and it's good for the rest of your life anyway, you know. So, so I, I know you can't see my screen, but you know, I don't even have this question written down yet. Somehow you preempted it. I was going to ask <laughs> you like, 
you know, as a recreational player, yes, yeah, sure, we all want to win, but you know, the primary goal is just to enjoy ourselves, to have fun. You said it yourself earlier, and I was going to ask, well, you know, why get into mental game coaching if you know if that you know it's like you should be focused on just having a good time, playing your best? Is it really that important uh, for a recreational player to to you know dive this deep? Uh, into like an A-game master class and, you know, into the prime mind like you've done? Well, I think that what's really important, um, and Federer Holtz once said this, I think it was in an interview with Elliot, um, that what's most important is that you know yourself, you know, mm. it's like understand why you're playing the game. You know, if you really don't care at all if you're winning or not, then don't spend your free time studying, you know, that would be dumb, you know, like, why would you do that, you know? If you want to make sure that you're at least a break even player, you're going to need to study, you know, a reasonable amount, you know, of some sort. Sure. Um, and then, you know, you just decide, hey, where's the bang for the buck? You know, if you're mm. somebody who wants to really compete and do well, you know, at higher levels, you're going to need the mental game stuff, too, you know, because, you know, you'll I mean, I had a friend contact me the other day. It felt like, you know, he has the knowledge, but then his ability to execute it in the moment wasn't there when he wanted it. You know, and so, you know, that to me, it's all part of the fun and the challenge is nice. the, the performance in the moment and how you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, being able to go back and look at, you know, each time that you played, you know, what were the things from a technical standpoint that you did well? What do you need to work on? You know, where were your mistakes? And then from the mental game standpoint, which isn't just mental, it's, you know, were you physically tired? You know, did you have a hard time sitting for a long time? How can you optimize those things? You know, and every single one of those is making you money. You know, when I was yeah. starting to get, I was starting to get like sciatica and back pain and stuff from mm. sitting too much um, with my work and then, you know, swapping out poker for, you know, what used to be skydiving, which is more active, right. you know? So like I bought a cushion, I take it with me, you know, to events and sit on it. I don't have it anymore. You know, that costs $20. You know, that's a mental game side. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, if anything that fits in the soft side, you know, goes in there. And right. so how do you, you know, how do you make sure that you have, you know, reasonable food and nutrition throughout the day so you can sure. mentally think your best and you're not having sugar spikes? It, any of that stuff goes in there and they're easy, you know? And so to me, if you're a recreational player, especially if you don't want to study so much, these are super easy things that you can do that, you know, take at least the knowledge that you have and allow you to execute it as optimally as possible, you know, Phenomenal. and so that's the reason to get excited about it. Phenomenal answer. And I would be remiss if I didn't, you know, you name dropped Jared Tendler. Uh, you know, he was episode number 35. You got to listen to that episode too, folks, if you haven't already. Um, so you've mentioned skydiving, you know, just like most people mention, you know, breathing, swimming, you know, just like, yeah, sure. It's brushing my teeth, skydiving. What possesses someone <laughs> so grounded to want to jump out of a plane, Doc? <laughs> no. Well, there's, uh, I mean, to me, as a kid, I was always fascinated with flying. I was fascinated with Peter Pan. Mm. And I went to, I, as a little kid, we went to an air show somewhere. And I think it was probably the Golden Knights in retrospect. I was a little, little kid. I was probably five or six. And they did something where they were like skydiving and doing um, this, I think it was probably what it's called diamond tracking, you know, and they mm -hmm. had like, you know, smoke on their feet. And, and I couldn't, couldn't believe that people were allowed to do that. They were allowed to skydive and how that worked and how they could parachute. And I just thought, I said, someday I'll do that for sure. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and I just knew I always would, you know, I just thought it was so cool. Okay. And, uh, and I knew when, when I did it, I wouldn't just like try it once and then check it off the list that I'd want to do it a bunch. So, okay. So what, so what is it that you enjoyed? What's that thrill that, that, you know, got your blood so, pumping? Yeah. Well, first full disclosure, I'm not skydiving anymore. Um, right. I quit a few years ago, but okay. um, what's, what's awesome about skydiving is you, you think mentally that what it's going to be is like a roller coaster thing with the stomach dropping out kind of a feeling. And it's not that at all. Hmm. Um, you know, when, unless you're jumping out of a helicopter or a balloon, which people do or cliffs, mm -hmm. um, most of the time you're leaving an airplane and it's going, right slowing down maybe to 90 knots or something, but you're still going fairly fast. And you're, so when you leave, you're basically skydiving into that wind sideways mm -hmm. at first, and then it's gradually transitioning to wind coming at you from below. Right. But you're not accelerating all that much. You're going oh. from say, 90 or hundred miles an hour to 120. So that what gives you that feeling is the acceleration, you know? Mm -hmm. And so instead what you're doing is just, you're leaving in an airplane and you're flying, you know, and 
you're flying with friends, you're doing, you know, kind of all these different physical maneuvers, you know, eventually, but whether you're doing that, or you're just like sitting and enjoying a sunset, you know, you're actually able to fly and your perception of what is happening, the ground is coming up very slowly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's not like you feel like you're hurtling to earth and the, the ground is in your face. It's so far away that you're just, you know, you really do feel like you're flying. And, huh. uh, and it's amazing. There's nothing that can just that can really describe it until you do it. You see the whole world around you in three dimensions. There's clouds, there's, you know, and you're just flying and you're part of it. And it's it's really incredible. So, and when you do big wave formations and stuff like I've done too, like the energy that you get when one of those comes together and everybody is, you know, in a huge connected formation, it's, sure. it's, it's nuts. It's electric. Right. You're not just any skydiver. You are a uh, world record holding skydiver. <laughs> and you mentioned Peter Pan, you know, uh, lived in Never Never Land, you know, never wanted to grow up or anything. I remember, you know, years ago, George, uh, President George Bush, uh, the elder, still jumped out of a plane when he was 80 something years old. Why'd you stop? I stopped because it was, um, I was having trouble with my neck, oh. basically, was the main thing. And also, I just was, um, you know, I was at a point competition wise as well, mm. where um, to can kind of take things to the next level, I was going to need to really up the, my game financially and Got time it. commitment wise and stuff like that. And it was just more than I was going to probably be able to do physically. That's and, fair. Uh, it doesn't mean that I had to quit, but um, I, what you don't want to do is be a very casual, occasional skydiver. You need to be doing it enough to be safe and regularly. Yeah. And, and that's another weekend activity. Uh, sure. sure. <laughs> once I, it really happened coincid coincided with when I started doing my new job where I'm working on a lot of weekends. Okay. So it became that much harder. Sure. Uh, okay. Do. That's fair. Um, well, you know, we're we're process oriented. We're proud of the way we work on our game, proud of the way we study. Uh, you know, we don't feel horrible when we bust out of an event because you know it doesn't affect us like it does a professional player. But dang, doesn't it feel good to win? How did it feel when you won your bracelet? <laughs> It was crazy. I couldn't, I mean, I, it, you have to take, takes a while to get your head around it. You know, um, you know, I stayed just so focused on trying to just focus on one hand at a time that it really didn't, it took a little bit to hit me, um, mm -hmm. but it was nice. I mean, I still had, I had friends there in the stands and, um, and that was just really cool. And I had a lot of people at home that were watching since it was streamed. Um, yeah. So I spoiled the surprise for my wife by calling her because it was <laughs> 45 minutes behind and we were all going to go out drinking. So I was like, I got to call her and tell her. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. What, so, was, there, people... was there sort of like a, a key moment during the tournament or during the final table where it did suddenly, you know, the gravity of the moment or the surrealness of the experience hit you or were you just really like laser focused until the final hand? No, I mean, I think... At first, it takes a little getting used to because it's the first streamed event I've been involved in, you know, so you're like, you know, getting used to the fact that there's like a microphone there. And I forgot several times during the thing that you have it because you're like, it picks up anything, obviously, that you're saying they don't like mute you at certain times, mm -hmm. you know, so you have to kind of make sure you're not chatting when you're not supposed to be and all that. Um, I wasn't perfect on that front, but, um, you know, and then it's just it's hot under the lights yeah. and all that stuff. And it's awkward and you got to remember to put your cards over the little thing and all of that stuff. So there's a, you know bit of kind of just getting settled in and then once you're settled in you know it's really with icm and stuff like that there's so much more to think about mm -hmm. at a final table that it's um you know you're very engaged in the whole thing you know and of course it was there was a very critical hand for me where i had to decide whether to call um, a four bet shove with ace king which in a way it looks like kind of goofy on the stream if you're watching it you're just like ace king is the nuts you know but you know just in the situation the way it was it really in the moment wasn't, <laughs> yeah, yeah it wasn't necessarily it was pretty close situation but i was like you know i'm i'm not here to try to, at this point to try to ladder up as i as i thought through it you know it's like there's a good chance this is going to be a coin flip and you know so you're just going to have to win your flips sure and it turned out not to be a coin flip which i was really lucky and happy that that was the case Right. And then I figured probably I was fairly certain I was going to be in a coin flip situation, but that it would put me in a much better shot to have a chance at winning the bracelet if I want it. So. It seems like you were incredibly focused. You know, you're talking about the moment, the situation, you know, quite frankly, like any professional player would, uh, you know, ICM and laddering and all that stuff, very much on your game. 
you know, what about looking around? You know, did you happen to, again, you know, a recreational player, a professional see each other all the time? You know, yeah, sure. Okay. I don't know how many bracelet events you playing, all that stuff. JJ Lou was there, you know, uh, women in poker hall of famer, I believe. Um, you know, did you find yourself intimidated at all by anyone at, you know, at the table or her presence, or it was just, you know, there are people in the way of, of me getting to the window circle. No, I mean, I think the more skilled a player who is at your table, the more, you know, you just need to be taking it into account as you're playing. Mm. I don't, I don't think I feel intimidated by people that I play with at all. Um, in that it's not like it's a life or death situation, it's still just poker. Um, but what you do is want to do, I mean, anytime you're at a table, you know, you don't want to be looking for ways to get involved with the most skilled person at the table, mm. you know, you want to be looking for ways to get involved with the least skilled people at the table. That should just always be the case. Um, you know, we make our money in poker when people make mistakes. So if somebody's right. going to be playing, you know, great, then you're just, you know, going to be relying, that's going to be much more high variance, you know, and so you just have to be play more cautiously around those, those people. Um, and, and that's it, you just have to adjust and uh, very level headed. That's great. Okay, level headed is, is wonderful. But then you win. <laughs> How did you celebrate? Was there any sort of splurge in the immediate or <laughs> yeah. delayed aftermath of uh, the bracelet win? No, I took everybody who was there who was on the rail. We we went out to um, I think it was uh, over at uh, Mandalay Bay. Is that where they have the um, uh, some place that we all sat outside with fire pits and oh, all that nice. stuff. We had everybody to dinner and drinks and we just hung out for a while. Awesome. So it was pretty neat. And uh, when I got home, my wife and I, you know, sat and like ordered Thai food and, and watch the replay. That's it's kind awesome. of funny. when you get done, you kind of just want to watch the replay. Yeah. You, know, you have no idea what really happened in the tournament. Like, right. you know how it turned out and like, you know, hands where cards were shown, but like yeah. most of the times you have no idea what was going on. I think we only had like two breaks mm -hmm. during the whole final table. Cause there was one actual break. And then you're like talking with people and trying to find out who had what and what they're doing. And I had people that were watching, you know, the, the live stream who could update me right. at that time. So and then mm -hmm. no, this was after that, it was just like setting up for heads up, you know, which was like a 10 minute break. And then that was it. There was like no more breaks. Right. So, yeah. So you kind of just want to know what happened. So that's interesting. Cause like, you know, you're almost in, in a unique situation cause you've won, you've done everything there is to do. You're sitting and watching it more for entertainment purposes, or you know, can you not help the competitive aspect of like you got to take notes? I'm like, oh, I noticed this mistake about myself. How can I do better next time? That sort of thing. Yeah, no, you know, I mean, I watched it for myself to look um, for physical tells, but really? also okay. like we went okay. over um, key hands um, in BBZ. Mm -hmm. I did a video with Jonathan Little, kind of like looking at key hands that were important hands because you know, I mean, I screwed up stuff up all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, oh, I want to brace it. So GI played perfectly. And I made lots of mistakes. And, um, you know, there's just, there's always stuff to learn from, but, you know, just seeing how other people are playing hands as well. It's, you know, there's yeah. tons to learn. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, again, you you, you name drop Jonathan Little, so I got to mention he was episode eight. We like doing that, you know, I guess. Not I don't everybody. Know. Yeah, he only tried, not everyone. We didn't get uh, Ape Styles, John Van Fleet, so hopefully we will get him soon uh, as well. Um, just two more questions, if that's all right, before we go into sure. the community questions. We do have we good on time? Have plenty of time. Okay, excellent, cool. So, um, you know, you, you win the bracelet. That's pretty cool, you know, and, you know, obviously something you do uh, for pleasure, uh, for recreation, almost in and of itself, like that's the goal of like, okay, I'm doing what I want to do with my free time. Um, it's nice to win. It's great. You know, you mentioned, oh, I just wanted to get to the final table. That's already off the bucket list, but you've already achieved more success, arguably, than most recreational players ever will have. Do you still have any other poker items on your bucket list? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's easy for people to go, you know, it's great. You've won a bracelet, not, it's not an open event, right? you know? And, um, you know, so I think final tabling a major open event is still a bucket list item. You know, that hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, I had like a run where I got the same exact cash like three years in a row at a WPT, in a WPT main event. It was like 37th or 36th or something three times in a row, which was kind of weird. But, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd really like to final table a WPT or another, um, you know, uh, WSOP event. Excellent. You know? 
I mean, and it's not like, oh, I've won a ring, so then I got that down. I can just win rings anytime you want. I mean, those anything is hard to win, <laughs> yes. you know, and uh, it's hard to final table things, let alone win them. Yeah. You know, so it's they're honestly not. Uh, I think it's silly to make a bucket list item of winning a bracelet or a ring. I think those are like, wouldn't it be neat kind of things, Yeah. you know, because you just it aligned for me. But I could have just been out of the ladies tournament at a couple of different points. It's not like I was never all in and you can't. You can't lose any all-ins and you can't get crippled completely right, right. You know, unless you make a miraculous comeback so um you know for me it's um you know i still play a lot i'm not just a completely casual recreational player obviously um but you know i there's still lots of bridges to you know or buildings to climb or however you say it mountains to climb <laughs> right okay well uh you know you look off in the distance you see certain mountains you know my last question for you you know we're at the beginning of august we're post wsop looking towards the end of 2022 what uh what do you have your eye on what's on your calendar for events you'd like to be playing until the end of the year um well i'm going to play wpt tampa in september nice. and then um after that I'm not sure what I'll be playing before next year's WSOP. There'll obviously be tournaments I'm going to play. Well, no, I actually I'm already lying because that's Maryland Live has a tournament series coming up in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to play that. Uh -huh. You know, we're like really spoiled here with um, the MGM and Maryland Live. You know, we have great tournament series that come up periodically that I don't have to travel for at all. Right. Um, so, you know, I'm playing in a 250k guarantee. You know, tournament that's just you know, I come home and sleep in my own bed. It's yeah. Pretty nice. So that's, you know, that's pretty good. But, you know, I'll be looking for other WPTs to play and maybe a circuit event. Uh, my wife's coming with me to Tampa. So awesome. hopefully that goes, goes well. That'll be the first one where she's come to a tournament thing as a couple. So Wonderful. hopefully she enjoys it. And then uh, we can do that more. Right. And, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? So you bust that, you go to the beach. Life is good. It's Florida. Well, that was great. Yeah, that's what I went. When I played the circuit event in New Orleans, you uh -huh. know, it was like that, where it's just like, Yes, I busted out and I'm getting oysters. <laughs> and like, out and uh, I'm going back to that duck place. Um, and I imagine that like going to play like EPTs, like especially like Barcelona would be amazing like that because you'd just be, you know, you'd almost be playing gambly just to get out there and uh, get some great food. Well, it's coming up at the end of this month if you want to, I'm on a plane. It's, <laughs> I've been there before. It's a, it's a fun one. That's for sure. Um, cool. Uh, so now we turn to the segment of the show, folks. We turn to you guys, our Cards Chat community, to see what questions you wanted to ask our guests. After all, you wanted our guests on in the first place. Uh, we have a dedicated thread on the Cards Chat forums for this. So as we announce who our future guests will be, please be sure to send in your questions for them. We're going to start off with Chica Bonita. Um, got, uh, ooh, got a good handful of questions from Chica Bonita. Uh, Doc, so, what do we go for? Okay, I like this one. Do you have an idol among women who play poker professionally that you look up to? If so, have you ever managed to play with her? What was the experience like? If not, how about among men as well? Boy, that's that's interesting. Um, you know, I think there's so many great women in poker right now. Um, you know, I've I got to know Jamie Kerstetter a little bit uh, during the the ladies event. She came with us when I went out to dinner with Ape Styles and some uh, and others, and she was great. And I honestly I enjoyed getting to play with with JJ. Um, Mikio was great as well. Um, you know, really, and you know, the, all the people that I played with at Final Table were great. Um, I'm not somebody who watches poker on TV as much, you know, um, so I don't have like you know specific idols that I think of that are just like you know, I, but maybe ape styles you know is my idol he's a man but okay he's you know as i think that as poker players go he's just like the nicest human you know he's and as a coach he's just been so great for me because he's um incredibly successful incredibly knowledgeable but just like super humble and chill and like not he's never speaking down to anybody and he wants people to have a good time and has such a good vibe and you know it just has such a great attitude and you know to me i think that's you know what really gets me excited is seeing players that have like a really good you know attitude about things you know and i think you know when i think back on my own past at times when i didn't understand as much about the game is when i would tend to get more like upset about bad beats or you know upset if somebody played a hand badly and i lost you know and you know i might 
have said some things, you know, like, oh, nice hand, you know, or some sarcastic <laughs> comments, you know, out of frustration and stuff. You know, I don't, I'm not proud of that um, part of it. So when I, you know, when I started seeing more professionals who really were, you know, gracious and genteel and like whatever, I was mm. like, yeah, you know, that's that's the way somebody should be right. uh, at the table and the way that someone should behave. And that's just looks so, you know, cool and collected. When somebody suffers a bad beat and they're just like, we count their chips and they move on with their life. Yep. And it's like, wow, he's like unshaken yep. by that. Like to me, that was like, whoa, if anything's intimidating, it's that when somebody just like, <laughs> that's poker and they move on with their life as opposed to, you know, getting riled up. So right. that, Great those kind of thoughts. Excellent. Very cool. Great answer. Uh, and definitely a, a good reminder of what it is it, what it is beyond just making a living that makes a professional player an actual professional uh, at playing poker. Uh, another one from Chica Bonita. It seems like you like being the best at everything you do, Doc. Winning at the WSOP, skydiving. Uh, are there any type, other types of leisure activities in which you have achieved such high success? Uh, probably just pool playing pool. So I got really hooked on pool playing in college. And I mean, I like to the point of like, I was playing like 12 hours a day. Whoa. Um, yeah, wow. just like playing a ton. Um, and so I started competing in pool when I was in, in, in college. And I think I took third nationally at a collegiate uh, nice. championship. I played at a couple of collegiate national championships. Um, but that, and that was for me the first time I think that I played in something competitive like that, you know, mm -hmm. because I wasn't in sports as a kid growing up, I didn't really have that aspect other than just like, I like playing games, but mm -hmm. wasn't the, uh, as much competing, you know, against other people like that. And I liked it. So that, um, you know, that, that got me excited. Um, so those really are the three main things. And I spent, so I spent the pool all through college. Um, and then in med school, it just got too much right. to keep doing. And then, so I wasn't doing anything during med school or really residency much. Um, well, that's not true. Residency after the first years when I started skydiving, but um, <laughs> <laughs> so I needed the stress relief. Right. Right. Very but, cool. uh, yeah. So, I mean, I was skydiving for 24 years. Yeah. It's not like I didn't give it a good go. Right. Um, and uh, so there was a lot of years of really being focused in that arena. So mm -hmm. now I also do Tai Chi um, and I'm starting to, to learn some of the other martial arts around Tai Chi a little bit. Um, but nothing, not, not competing or anything in that yet. Unbelievable. I mentioned at the outset, again, I was just giddy, like, wow, just so cool. You just never, like, it's like, what a, what a cool thing. Oh yeah, sure. I'll just take up Tai Chi. I'm going to learn Greek. Like, it's just, wow. It's just really, really, really cool. Love it. I, love I thought the... with, tai, with Tai Chi, it was during the pandemic. I was just like, okay. I'm just like hanging around the house, like all the time. I'm like, there's got to be something new I can do. That's like something different. And I need to do something that at least is slightly physical. Cause I'm just like, working in the office and then yeah. playing poker. So that's why I started to, to do it. Right. Okay. Very cool. Uh, one more from uh, Chica Bonita. This is a question usually I ask. I'm a, a big time mixed game uh, guy and I enjoy lots of stuff beyond Hold'em. How about yourself? Uh, you know, how about PLO, any other limit games, some stud, or is it just, you know, Hold'em or bust? Yeah, I'm so non-exciting in that front. Um, <laughs> you know, my only experience with Omaha has, was back like in the early days of playing like on Paradise Poker, if you want Ooh, to date me. That's a throwback, and, uh, yeah. Of like signing up for a sit and go and then like four cards, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? I I'm like, that. I don't even know what this game is. I'm going to just play it like hold them and hope for the best. I think I actually like won a heads up Omaha game that way. Right, but, back uh, then I'm, on Paradise Poker, you could do that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right. That's This is the days, nobody had any idea. And uh, and I I would I used to play in a couple home games and it was one of these things where like one round was always like Omaha and I had no idea I'm like four aces to my hands this is the nuts <laughs> you know I just didn't know anything about it and you know and I probably like it probably be good to branch out but I just figure with the amount of time that I'm willing to put on poker which is a lot as it yeah. is I feel like I'm still like there's so much that I need to learn hmm. uh, to 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 get to where I want to be and hold them. 
Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, Crystals has some questions for you, Doc. Um, oh, this is, I like this one. Okay. Now, again, I might know the answer. I'm not 100% sure. Crystals wants to know uh, as follows You played the 2016 WSOP, but then took a few years off from the series. What eventually brought you back to Vegas? My guess, you know, before I'm not going to, I don't know what the answer is, but my <laughs> guess is perhaps they were just sort of looking at your Hendon mob and there were no WSOP results. Were you there every year? Yep. Yeah, I don't think I missed. I, no, you know what? I did miss one year. Um, I think, I think I might have still gone in a different week, but I may have missed one year because we were going. I wanted to play the main event, but then I couldn't. A friend was having a fiftieth birthday party, uh -huh. and uh, we were like all going out to a house she rented in Carmel. I'm like, I'm not missing oh, that. Nice. Sorry, um, but no. A lot of the years, um, I, a lot of the years, I was going and just playing the main event. So oh, if you don't get okay. the main event, then nothing shows up on your hand, and you know. And some of the time, I would like. Cash, like bust the main event and then go hop in the one drop, you know, or okay. go play daily or do whatever. And so cash would show up there, but um, I was I've mostly been there. Um, so considering the amount of events you've played, that's a pretty high cash to playing ratio, all things yeah. considered. Yeah, if I took out the main event, I'd be looking pretty good at the WSOP and circuit stuff. Wow. Exciting. That's very, very cool. All right. Hopefully uh, that doesn't mean there's a lot of bad variants coming soon to even it out. <laughs> okay. Well, again, you know, you'll hopefully balance that out with a lot more play. So it'll just, you know, there we it'll go. be we'll spread out. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, our last question asker, one of our most uh, interesting folks, Acid Burn FX. Thank you so much for submitting some questions uh, for Dr. Laura Eisenberg. Uh, Doc, uh, Acid Burn FX, love that name, wants to know if you had $100,000 to give away to any cause, what cause would you choose and why? Wow. There's, there are, there's a lot of good causes and I do um, donate uh, to charity, but right now I would say that um, Central Food Kitchen, mm. Jose Andres Charity, I think is doing really amazing work and it's really timely work right now. Um, so he, if you don't know, he he has a lot of restaurants in the D.C. area and now around the world as well. Um, he's a Spanish chef um, and he, uh, I think, got especially famous for telling Trump where he could stick it with the, <laughs> wanting him to put a restaurant in his hotel. And he said, no thanks <laughs> after your comments about Mexicans. Um, and now he actually, I think, is going to put a restaurant in there now that it's no longer Trump's hotel. There you go. <laughs> but that being said, the World Food Kitchen, um, they go in um, to basically areas that are hit by various disasters mm. and they just set up shop and start giving people meals wow. um, and like good meals because he's a really good chef. Um, but they've been doing a ton of work in Ukraine and like not only on the like Polish border and stuff like that where it's easier to set up shop, but going into Ukraine itself as well. Um, and now just with our disasters that we're having here and floods and things, he's just mm. been recently doing some work in Kentucky and just everywhere you turn around, he's just like full on in and dedicated to this cause himself and, and going to these places and really setting it up. I mean, the man's just a saint. And so yeah. I, I like giving uh, to, to them. Beautiful, beautiful answer, beautiful cause. Uh, again, that's a World Food Bank, it's called, you said? World Food Kitchen. World Food um, Kitchen. World Cent World Central Kitchen, maybe World Central Kitchen, WCK, I think. Cool. Um, cool. And Jose Andre is fantastic food and and very good uh, and very good charity. Excellent. Uh, two more from Acid Burn FX. I specifically like this question considering uh, everything we've spoken about until now. You know, someone who clearly, uh, you know, it's not just you take a day and throw it in the garbage. Like you make the most out of your day, your hours, your time is precious to you, and that much more so. Thank you again for for giving us uh, an hour of your time, Doc. Uh, Acid Burn FX wants to know if there were twenty six hours in a day, what would you do more of? Probably study. Um, you know, for me, one of the things that's tricky is you know, trying to get the, all the things I want to get done in a day. I mean, for everybody is tough, um, you know, but I think part of the way that I'm able to get through the poker content that I want to get through is slightly suboptimally, you know, as far as educators would say, you know, you should be nothing but focused on it and taking notes and doing all these other things. And I think that's great. And if you have the time to dedicate and just do that, I think it's great, but I think that sometimes amateurs may get put off with studying in that they feel like if they can't do that, then they're not going to do anything, you know, and I don't think that that's necessarily 
necessary. Might necessarily. I don't right. think it's necessary. Right. And that I think you can have a video, you know, and not going while you're like watching TV or you're just doing something else. You do need to be focused on it while you're watching it, but you can do it in pieces, mm -hmm. you know, and you can learn to be very focused in watching things while you're doing things that don't require attention, right. you know, whatever it's, whether it's brushing your teeth, you know, or waiting for, you know, the water to boil for something, right. or whatever it is you do. If you can make use of all those little pieces of time for doing various things, that's how you get through a lot of stuff in a day. Excellent. Um, you know, but, you know, it's, there's, it's so easy to fill time, you know, and when I, when I was laid up with COVID on my first WSOP trip this year, and uh, I couldn't do a whole lot. I played online poker one day, but you just, you just think like, you know, man, I'm going to have all this time. I'm going to get caught up on everything. Like my finances will be all caught up and, you know, I'll catch up on reading and I'll do all these <laughs> things. And it's like each day just goes by like that. And mm -hmm. you're just like, wow. You know, but, um, you know, it's, I love so many different things. I love spending time with my wife and, you know, we just like, we'll relax and watch a, a TV show in the evening and have a nice meal together. And any of those things that are small, taking a walk to go somewhere and get a glass of wine. Sure. Um, all of those things, you know, that can just fill up a day in no time. So. Mm. Well, um, the number one answer on our survey was sleep but we will accept uh, those answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super focused on sleep. Um, so I've got my aura ring and uh, oh, nice. when I, as far as tournament prep goes, like if I'm at a series, the, the one thing I will never take out of my pregame prep is sleep. Brilliant. So yeah, if you have sure. a late, if you have a late night the night before, cause that's when the tournament went late. The first thing I do is I try to get eight hours of sleep. And then I yeah. look and see how much time do I have left before I have to be there and whatever else gets fit in there gets fit in there, but sleep never gets shortchanged if I can help it. Yeah, if you don't charge that phone at night, you will run out of battery. You know, it's uh, definitely very, very important. Um, our final question for you, Doc, uh, Acid Burn FX. Thank you for this one. I like this one as well, very creative. Uh, if you could wake up tomorrow having gained one ability, what would it be and why? Wow. That's amazing. I'd have to let me think about that. We'll give you, you know, a time bank chip. Yeah, the unlimited time bank chip. <laughs> the um, you know, I mean, I think you'd want something ideally that can benefit lots of different people besides yourself. Mm. You know, and uh, I'm not sure, you know, what that would be. It'd have to be something like really big. And um, but if it's just like a skill, like being able to fly or do something like that, like being able to fly would be fun. But I think um, if it's a, boy, it's hard. I have to think about that for a minute. Give me another question while I'm thinking on a back well, burner. So what we'll do is while you think we're gonna wrap it up and you will definitely get your answer before we go, but I will use this opportunity to thank you very, very much for your time, Doc. Uh, you know, my excitement for this interview was uh, not, uh, you know, not, not for naught. <laughs> I certainly enjoyed myself and getting to meet you, getting to know you. Um, and uh, I'm sure that uh, the questions you have answered, uh, you know, definitely uh, excited our Cards Chat audience. And I will also remind everyone out there in the audience, uh, just, you know, guys, don't forget, send in your questions uh, for future podcast guests once we announce them in the dedicated thread on the forums. And please be sure to give us a good review on iTunes. Spread the word via your social media channels if you like the show. Uh, we're going to call the clock on you, Doc. So what do you right. think? Uh, read, me the question one, read me the question one more time. So Absolutely. Sure I'm if you could wake up tomorrow having gained one ability, what would it be and why? If there's a, if it's, I mean, it sounds sappy, but if there, if there's a way to be able to make people who you meet happier, mm. I think that would be it. Well, you, you know? clear that clearly happened last night because you just, you know, you made me really happy with that <laughs> answer. That was, that's great. Nothing sappy about that. And I think that's beautiful. And it certainly is very consistent with what I've heard over the last hour plus. And I'm sure uh, <laughs> everyone in the audience is nodding their heads as well. Uh, you know, more power to you. It's a beautiful answer. Uh, it's just, uh, we need more Dr. Laura Eisenbergs in this world, not just the poker world. And uh, I think the world would be a, a much better place. So uh, anything else uh, before we let you go that you'd like to share with our audience? 
No, this has been great. Thanks. I appreciate it. And uh, it's been great getting to talk to you. Awesome. Thanks, Doc. I'll thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the Cards Chat Podcast. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day. Mm-hmm.